Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our webinar. My name is Robert Michalik, and I'm the International Sales Manager at ASECO. I will be your host today and will be happy to guide you to our presentation called Security and Seamless User Experience in Authentication, How to Achieve Both. Definitely not an easy question or an easy task at hand, but we will try to use the hour ahead of us to show you our experience and what we do with customer authentication, how it implies your business, your IT needs usually, also the regulatory aspect of those projects, and how uh, we help our customers to, to find a balance between. In these you know, COVID times, definitely uh, my picture is here to show you a friendly face. However, uh, we, we are fully, fully remote today. I hope you are mostly uh, you know, at safe place somewhere at home or in office. And uh, to guide you to this presentation, I will use my experience of the last nine years where I've been involved in a lot of digital banking projects, a lot of security and authentication projects in Europe, Africa, uh, United States, as well as uh, in Asia. So the good thing about this is that we can definitely jump in on, on the agenda at hand. And we hope to, to give you some content today that you will like, that you can take with you. The goal is to share our experiences and, of course, to have you uh, participating, participating in this webinar. So please use the Q&A or the chat part of the uh, webinar tool to ask some questions. We will try to answer them during the presentations or uh, at the end if there are some. Of course, if there will be some detailed or technical questions, we can always address them in a follow-up later on. So the agenda is uh, basically how to stay secure in the era of impatient customers. We'll talk about our customers, which are, as everything in life, changing and uh, becoming more and more demanding. Then which authentication method or a process or a flow should be the one best suited for your organization? Some still use SMS, some, some use more advanced authentication methods, but definitely there is different options on the market and some that you might have a look at uh, which will be best for you. Then something that's quite, uh, let's say, popular these days or quite uh, actual these days is strong authentication for remote work. Since we are uh, a lot uh, affected today by the new reality and the remote work is de, de facto becoming a new standard for, for a lot of aspects of our business. Then, of course, there is the business uh, decision of how to co cut the cost uh, for, for authentication and use this process to improve the user experience. This is a hard one, of course. We believe it's possible. We can show you some examples how our customers manage to optimize such an investment and, of course, have a, a better result for their customers in the end. In the end, we see that um, authentication is becoming an ecosystem. Uh, and uh, it's always an effort, of course, because authentication touches different aspects of every organization. Is it an IT, regulatory, compliance, or the business aspect? And uh, there is no business of authentication. Usually it's supporting the business. However, it is a critical part of it. And we believe that reducing the effort for the organization on the overall level and some best practices we've seen with our customers is the go way to go. And we hope we can share some of this experience with you. Uh, to do an intro about ASECO, uh, looking at the attendee list, I see names that I know. And of course, you are our partners from all around the world. I will not spend too much time. Uh, ASECO is, a, let's say, a, a software producer and a security uh, powerhouse and definitely a service provider that's doing different business uh, in Europe, in Africa, in, in Asia. And uh, I will not spend time on this. Maybe it's important to mention that for these solutions and our experience we are talking about today, which is the strong customer authentication solutions, we have more than 20 years of experience. We have more than 120 references internationally. And uh, our, our know-how here is much wider than just being a security provider. We, are, we understand the regulation in Europe, but also in, in different parts of, of the world, like in Africa, where we are... Uh, having a lot of projects today, and uh, that we know that uh, there is a fine balance between the regulatory need and the security need, and the very important need, which is the user experience need of your customers, where they need to be 
comfortable in operating the system, they will use that it's definitely safe. And in the end, that we get to the goal, the, the, the right place, which is the seamless user experience. So we can use the ASECO, let's say, profile to help you in, in different aspects and different case studies. And we will we'll try to show it also today. So first part of this presentation is how to stay secure in the era of impatient customers. What do I mean by impatient customers? Well, pretty much I can see it on my behavior, for example. I'm a 32-year-old 30, guy that's very much in banking, very much in digital, very much in security, by the way. I would probably be the geek user in your organization. However, uh, I, I get uh, services from my providers, which are my financial institutions, my payment providers. And I want always to have even better user experience. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us can, you know, uh, relate to this. Since people have less and less time, uh, your w work is taking more and more. It's always on. You're probably, you know, checking your email even after work hours sometimes, even though you don't like to. Maybe you're you know, now at home office somewhere and it's not easy to focus. So this is not something that's new or this is not something that's not expected. Basically, this is something that's happening all over the world and it's affecting all, let's say, uh, age profiles. However, some of them are even more uh, impatient. Some of them are even more demanding compared to, let's say, uh, what we used to see maybe three years ago or even or five years ago. But definitely time is becoming a very important resource uh, for the customers at hand. So we have some examples here where you can see, uh, you know, boomers uh, have five minutes to do anything if you're offering them a product or something. For example, the new millennials or even Generation Z, they will have five seconds of their time for you. And this is, I would say, the reality we all need to accept. Sooner or later, with different pace, it will become uh, the, the, let's say, the place where we need to be. Uh, a nice example from Cisco, uh, they made an analysis of account importance by type. This means how much for your customers. OK, today, looking at your profiles, it's mostly financial sector people at this. And this is the uh, webinar for the financial sector. Banking and finance is very important for the customers, meaning they are very uh, prudent. They, they need to be very secured with their account data, with their money, or with their financial instruments. And it's very important that the security for this is at a high level. However, the, the data security and the, even you know all, all over the security of, of your accounts is growing in importance in today. So you can see even 32% of people want to make sure their social media account is, is secured, that they are health account, 28%. So the awareness of people is growing that their services need to be secured however they need to be very user friendly because the next part we, we which we used from our um, uh, let's say from jumio in the market is why do millennials abandon for example mobile banking if the process is too long if they forgot a password if the authentication was time consuming they will abandon it so it's a fine and delicate balance between how secure it is and how nice and easy it is to use because the new generation is the on-demand generation and they don't have time to waste on any service they, they're getting. They want it now and they, not, they want it easy. So it's always nice to show you an example that is quite new. When you focus very much on the user experience, but maybe you don't focus that much on the security part. This is an article that I've screenshotted yesterday. I think it's from the, yeah, June 15, where uh, it's quite, let's say, uh, actual to us that uh, web skimmers, meaning some hackers that would inflict the web shop of uh, quite a popular sporting online web shop called Intersport in, in our region in Southeast Europe, they targetedly attacked not one, but five countries of Intersport and injected their malicious code to skim the credit cards of customers that are buying things online. Of course, uh, I'm pretty sure you are aware that a lot of business and a lot of e-commerce is now booming online. So it will not be an easy time for Intersport to do to make their you know customers use their web shop. And even I guess it's not nice when you look at 
you know, news portals today in the region. If you use the Intersport with your credit card, please call your bank. Well, you know, it's not the bank's fault, definitely, but it's an ecosystem, like we man, uh, mentioned before, an ecosystem of trust. If all the parties there are, let's say, building trust, it's going to be a very nice and growing environment. If, uh, let's say, news like this get more and more, definitely the business will be affected. So uh, having a, you know, a static card number used only for this web shop, I would be very, let's say, afraid. And if I would use Intersport that days, I would call my bank definitely. Having, for example, strong authentication in 3D Secure by Visa and MasterCard and, and Aseco, I would feel much more comfortable uh, that my you know, data, even if it was skimmed, it cannot do any harm because I know that for any transaction, I should use a strong customer authentication process. But to show you this example, we will go later on. There are different options when you want to secure customers, and this is definitely, and it's regionally different, it's regulatory different, it's different in the parts of the world. So there are still countries where SMS is king, and it will be there for the long time ahead, I guess, because it's generating one-time passwords and delivering it through SMS as a nice and easy way to do it to some very advanced behavioral authentication. So. Uh, I would say that there is definitely some soul searching or analysis to be done by every organization to check what's the best authentication for us. There are pros and cons from user experience, security, and cost every, in, every, in every one of them. However, we wanted to show you examples and how we see some of the pros and cons of those uh, methods in the market. So one example is SMS. So it's here for a long time. Your customers know how to use it. It's easy. Everybody knows what an SMS is. Probably you don't need to train your customers a lot. On the other hand, each SMS has a cost. I'm pretty sure uh, whoever did the business case for an e-banking or an e-commerce uh, payment platform, they know they need to take this cost into account. And of course, as being here for a long time, there are quite advanced ways how to fraud or how to attack SMS OTP as a, as a, let's say, authentication method, be it mobile operator, interception, social engineering, or man-in-the-middle attack. In Europe, we have definitely uh, a push by PSD2 that SMS is becoming de facto not at the level enough to provide PSD2 compliance, for example, for dynamic linking or for uh, strong customer authentication. So you could say that in Europe, we are seeing more and more of SMS being phased out. In a lot of countries, it was done even before. Hardware tokens, another, another example being used for authentication. They are a very useful device when your customers don't have a mobile phone or even a smartphone. However, I would say that the customers that are not having a smartphone or a mobile phone, you will not get a lot of transactions from them on any digital channel, probably. So we have some new hardware tokens offered by vendors with QR code readers. They are quite improving the user experience of the customer because the issue with hardware tokens, of course, is that you have to type in a lot manually. And of course, it's good because it does not require an internet connection. However, you know, if you ever had a hardware token, it's probably stored somewhere on your secure desk or somewhere. You never have it with you when you need it. The user experience is not that fluid and you must log in with a pin. Push notifications are something uh, which is bound to the software token approach, which is uh, something which we will focus on today's presentation as well. This can be a standalone application or it can be integrated to your existing mobile app. And we will show examples like this. The nice thing about push is there is no additional cost to it compared to SMS. So you are sending the notification and the data about the transaction to the customer through the mobile uh, uh, operating systems and there is no cost to you as an operator and there's a nice um, let's say report by cisco that people really save time with push notifications they are faster and to be honest the the users these days are used to push notifications you know the communication is more and more moving from sms or even from phone calls to be to be honest other than video calls but people are using push notifications to be notified and to do actions uh, on WhatsApp, on Facebook, on everything. So push notifications are becoming, like SMS, the very widely accepted technology by the users. The 
you know the the the, need, the necessity of push push notifications is that you need a mobile app so is it uh, as i said a standalone mobile token or it's an integrated sdk software development kit to your existing mobile app it's definitely bound to some application that is controlled by you and we have seen some complications in the market like trade wars meaning google services is no longer supported on huawei devices but we also seen that the market responded quickly huawei offered their services to support this and for example aseco is already supporting their way of doing the push and communication so it can be definitely addressed uh, in due time behavior analysis is something that's happening more and more it's a new thing let's say on the on the market it's providing the best let's say value for the customers so we as a software provider or a service provider and our customers the banks are getting to focus more on frictionless user experience, meaning we can identify the customer and even authenticate them much more by the way they are using the service. Is it their mobile app, mobile phone, You know how they use it, where they are located, how often they're making such a transaction. We can follow these behaviors and with machine learning and, and using some nice AI uh, partners, we can improve the user experience by no need for a pin or password or by no need to even for a you know, strong process of authentication. So the, the, the customer behavior becomes the authentication methods and it's becoming silent for the customers. It's a very nice thing, let's say, from a user perspective and something very advanced from the technology stack that's being used. Definitely there are uh, people that will like this and people that will not. Some people don't like that the service provider or you as an organization understands them that well so they might feel that you're watching them or you know that uh, you need to access this uh, or or give consent to use this data definitely in in the you know uh, eu gdpr world but people that are used to this they will they will definitely appreciate that you will uh, use less authentication and force less authentication on them and that you will know this is my customer and i know that this is not a fraud attempt okay There are some things to consider in 2020. Uh, we're already at the half of the year. I would say, for me personally, it, it flew by very fast. I'm pretty sure uh, it's different than what we all planned when we looked at you know, outlook for 2020. But we are seeing some things which are in Europe, but also everywhere near Europe or everywhere in the world. So legal requirements being pushed by PSD2, by countries that want to follow PSD2, meaning Payment Service Directive 2, or countries that will have similar local regulations. We have seen this in Africa, in Asia as well. There are definitely requirements that need to be addressed. There is difference compared to retail banking and corporate banking when looking at your authentication uh, ecosystem. The UX is becoming key. It's very much the, the you know, the 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 key to every business uh, uh, in digital definitely going forward and we are seeing a lot of our customers moving to cloud uh, providers uh, i will show in our demo we are fully cloud ready so our solution is being deployed in amazon web services in microsoft azure for us it's pretty much whatever the organization we are working with prefers and we can support you in all of those aspects is it cloud is it the private cloud or is it an on-prem installation by the customer? Something where we wanted to put focus is the PSD2. PSD2 is, a, let's say, last year's news already in, in most of the EU countries. However, uh, a lot of them uh, close to EU are having such or similar regulations being announced or even being with hard deadlines already today. And uh, the PSD2 basically shows that uh, you can you can impact your business quite dramatically so it's not something that we asked for but it's definitely there so in eu we have seen basically it's a disruption disguised as a regulation so there is an impact on the bank's business however there is also definitely an impact on the it systems and psd2 uh, is wider than authentication uh, per se. So it touches transaction monitoring, which is an anti-fraud system in the bank. It touches the need for an uh, API, meaning application programming interface to open the bank, open the bank data to the customer account to some third-party providers. 
and also it's definitely standardizing the level of of all of those authentication and security needs for all the uh, required parties so uh, some some banks businesses of course looked at it as a compliance cost which definitely it is and as a risk for their card transaction fees or quality of customer interactions since, since some third party providers might become the front end to, to their digital channels. From the IT view, definitely this is a headache as well. You had to open a lot of data to third party providers and you have to do it in a secure way since um, of course it's regulated, but the deployment and the implementation was a bit, let's say open to different kinds of interpretations. At ASECO, uh, we, we understood the PSD2. We are, to be honest, one of the, uh, let's say, rare providers in the market that cover all of the areas I mentioned. So from secure customer authentication, transaction monitoring, providing APIs and providing common and secure communication, ASECO has solutions or services for all of those areas. Uh, this has been quite a successful approach for us since we managed to make sure that all of our customers are PSD2 compliant. In some projects, we did full PSD2 enabler setup, meaning we did all the scope of PSD2 for some banks, and that was all uh, with the tight deadline that we managed to achieve. With some of our customers, we will continue to do this, and there are some, uh, let's say, announcements by uh, countries that are close to EU that will go to PSD2, and of or similar, let's say, regulations, and also GDPR or similar regulations, and we will definitely be supporting that process. Looking at the key requirements of PSD2, you can see them on this screen. I will not go into too much details, but it basically uh, touches different areas, as I mentioned. It's not only authentication, it's making sure that transaction monitoring and risk analysis in place. So, for example, you can do legally now a transaction as a customer without any authentication because your bank will say i know this customer i have monitored this transaction i ha i can i have qualified the risk and i can let him frictionlessly do this transaction that he's sending every month to his mother for example because i know there is no risk so this is i would say a very good push for the customer they can get much better user experience if of course the bank has everything according to regulations in place so let's not look at the changes in the authentication only as a challenge but also as a as an option to improve the customers uh, let's say recognition of your brand one thing that's quite a hot topic as i mentioned these days is strong authentication for remote work uh, at one point in time, I guess, you know, 50% of this planet worked remotely. And to be honest, it worked, which is a good thing. Most, you know, some some uh, companies, as you have seen probably in the media, are going to allow this option of work indefinitely. However, the important thing about remote work is there's a lot of data and a lot of sensitive data going around, you know, very unsecured Wi-Fi's or mobile networks. So why is authentication needed for remote work? Most red data breaches involve weak default or stolen passwords. For example, 80% uh, of breaches are caused by credential theft. 73% of passwords are duplicate, du duplicates. What does this mean? So to give you an example of me, and I'm a guy that's in digital banking and security as a profession, I still have some passwords being used from my high school. And you know, maybe I will change one number at the end, or maybe I will add a couple of you know, ABCs at the end. But, uh, you know, if you will get one of my passwords, you could say I'm at a big risk. And this is, you know, this is the reality. I, I'm pretty sure even the, the security officers in some banks have such a such a <laughs> such weak spots. However, I do have awareness that when I have a security uh, risky kind of an account, I will always enable two factor authentication. This is in, you know, a second world. All of our communication internally is always signed with an ASECO software token. Uh, but if I'm using, uh, I don't know, a website like Google, I will use Google Authenticator. So uh, you can use two-factor authentication on Facebook today or definitely in your, all of your banking accounts. So passwords are there and they will be there still for some time until we can completely remove them. But it's important that we have an added security, which is two-factor or multi-factor authentication when there is a risk 
of data or, or such a breach. And our customers, meaning the banks mostly, are using the same system, which we'll show you today, for their customers, meaning, you know, securing online banking, but also for the internal VPN needs, for example, of the bank, for remote work, for logging into Windows domain. You can use the same even application in the UX for your customers and also for your employees. So even Microsoft, which is, I guess, somebody that threads carefully when making such bold statements, they claim that 99% or even 99.9% of these attacks could be blocked by multi-factor authentication because these are all attacks on static passwords. So remote work will be here for time being, and definitely I would say more and more in the future. Having it secured enough is key to make sure that it will work as planned. How to cut the cost and improve user experience? Is it even possible? So. Yeah, this is the the mantra that everybody will try to uh, to achieve, but we believe it's a fine and delicate balance. So definitely the balance for every uh, security uh, solution or for, for any secure sec solution that requires security, it's a balance between the security and the customer's user experience. So if it's very secure, you know, you can plug it off <laughs> the internet and the electricity, it's gonna be very secure, but nobody will use it. So uh, there, there's a nice quote by, by Steve Jobs that, you know, even at the SECO we like to try out when we are envisioning new uh, product features is you have to start with the customer experience and then work back towards the technology. So if we can make it very secure and if our uh, security experts will say, this is the only way to do it, then probably we are not doing our best. So we need to get into this war room, into this blackboard or whiteboard, somebody that will say, hey, I don't understand how to do it. So we, we like to try to, to make sure that this is addressed and you will see in the demo how we try to do it with push notifications, with QR codes, so that it's, let's say, somehow intuitive for the end user and not only secure and that only the compliance guy maybe is happy, but nobody else is. And what does good user experience mean? You can see, you know, we wanted even to make a, a, a pool in this webinar, how much of you will say some of these, you know, keywords, and I'm pretty sure there would be 50 more. So what does good UX mean? Is it that it's a satisfied customer, that it's credible, that there is less clicks maybe to open an account, that it's valuable information, that it's useful, that it's easy to navigate, contextual human findability? I mean, there is no clear definition of user experience, but we will try to show you an example how user experience is evolving, how, how user experience was looked at before, or how, example, for example, user experience looks like, and the expectations for user experience looks like today. So some time ago, a bank was an institution that had a nice, you know, big walls, probably marble and everything in it, where you would go as a customer to pay bills, perform transactions, and, you know, do some loans and savings in a, in a very nice building. Today, uh, later on, their internet banking and ATMs appeared with hardware tokens and secured definitely online channels. This was called an alternative channel, by the way, and it was used by maybe two or 3% of the customers. Then we went to getting it more online, however, with some very nice and complicated forms, which had 50 lines of data that the customer needed to do to be able to, to do such a process in the bank. Then we made mobile phones appearing in the market with nice applications performing transactions via internet and mobile. Uh, biometry came onto, onto the place, so multi-factor authentication and fraud management become easier. So you can use probably today a uh, fingerprint on your phone or a face ID to unlock. But the new reality and the new expectation from your customer is the so-called one click or least number of clicks. It's never one click, however, they, they market it. But even in Corona times, we have seen it very much that regulation can be adopted very fast and adjusted and that people can make their banking and any other business actually fully online and with less number of clicks and with less number of data than we thought and dreamed about before. So in Europe, you can now do your tax registration fully online by sending an email while before you had to visit the branch. And pretty much 
the expectations from the new customers, the ones that are booming or the ones that are, let's say, coming to the market is that this process will become more and more simple, but still very secure. The data and the awareness of my ownership of this data is growing definitely with the younger generation. So we need to make sure that these UX expectations are uh, addressed and, and let's say uh, honored for our customers. How to get there? It's not an easy, it's not an easy process. Don't, don't get me wrong. There are 20, 50, 100 of scenarios you could try out and nobody can guarantee that the, the perfect one is there, but definitely uh, any improvement will be well uh, received by your customer, probably by your regulator as well, and also by your bottom line in the cost. So first of all, the question we should be asking ourselves and which we usually do when we are talking with our new customers because our existing customers and with our existing customers as well is are all the authentication methods and devices you have in place actually needed you know how many of your users are actually using this service is it two percent compared to 98 percent that are actually doing transactions so we should be very prudent in asking such questions what of this is actually used and some of them are maybe uh, outdated are changed and maybe we should uh, re revisit them then we should offer customer benefits if they switch to improved customer authentication because every change is pain uh, i don't like to change uh, probably you know even worse uh, how my mother or father would like to change and you know every change is an effort for for a customer to to change it so there are customer benefits that need to be offered to to, to change to a new device, to a better flow in authentication. All of the authentication flows should be centralized. This is the real user experience, not some nice and shiny screen. What, what I mean by this? So if you're a bank and you have a credit card from the bank and you have a mobile banking and you have an internet banking, and for example, you have a mobile banking application, you wanna make a transaction, you do it with the mobile banking app. Then you go to an e-commerce site with the card from the same bank and you want to make an e-commerce transaction and the bank will say ah oh, you need to do another mobile token application or you need to have another authentication workflow or ah oh, sorry you're not enrolled please call the call center now or visit the nearest branch to enable your card this is not the real ux i want to have i already did this all for example for e-banking and now you're telling me you're the same bank, you're the same logo, you're the same systems in the background. I cannot do it. No, I'm thinking you are my single point and you are, you know, you are my logo, you are my business. I want you to handle all of my needs. So all of this can be centralized with a single system and for example, with a single authentication application. And in the end, of course, go with things that don't require a branch visit. And there is always, uh, uh, let's say, a challenge here, how to push a little bit the regulator, push the internal compliance. But if nothing, I think this situation in the corona or COVID times has shown that a lot of things can be done remotely, even though until yesterday, it was regarded as impossible. So let's challenge this as well. What we like to do and try to build with our customers and it's never a big bang project it's always a phased approach we we understand the reality and the complexity of of the ecosystems in in our customers is how to build an authentication ecosystem to reduce the effort for the organization what does this mean so reducing you know customer visiting the branch for a token unlock or customer calling a call center is a tremendous impact and the overall bottom line of the whole organization. Sometimes it's not even measured. In a lot of organizations we know, it's not measured how much effort or money or time you're spending from your call center on unblocking tokens or on the branch visits for, for somebody to replace the hardware token battery or the hardware token itself. So we believe that the power of digitalization is in this ecosystem. So you could have all of this in place to reduce the effort needed once it's there, of course, it is a project, don't get me wrong, to make sure that there is less work on this authentication because nobody is doing banking for authentication. 
come on, nobody likes authentication. It's it's something that you have to do to do your banking, to do your e electronic payment, to do your ATM withdrawal. But still, you have to have it in a secure enough way for the users to be confident to give you their you know trust. So we see this ecosystem as four pillars. One thing is the authentication server side, which can be centralized and ensures higher security pro for proving the user identity. And I've mentioned some examples like uh, e-banking uh, or, or, or e-commerce or internal VPN needs, all of them there. Soft token or mobile token, definitely the go-to solution these days compared to SMS, compared to hardware tokens. There is a very nice business case, user experience and security uh, sweet spot that mobile token brings compared to every other authentication uh, available today. Identity and access management as a solution uh, that, it, that can control these workflows. So uh, maybe your customer can log in in your e-banking and if they need a you know, trading application for, for their stock exchange, you will again ask them to do this. With a single sign-on process and in that access management, they could do this once and they could do all of their banking, which includes third-party applications maybe, in a, in a single authentication workflow. And in the end, something that we see as a big investment, by the way, from ASECO, is something we called AI-powered security. So we are taking more and more of customer behavior, the data of the customer, of course, if the customer approves it, and making sure that the security is improved and also the frictionless approach of their authentication. So definitely there are challenges. You need to have security. Uh, authentication methods that depend on only one factor are very easy to compromise. If there is less, uh, let's say, layers in place, there is higher risk. Having a weak authentication solution that relies, for example, only on static passwords, like we saw with the uh, web shops being hacked on the beginning, is definitely vulnerable to attacks. Bad user experience and outdated processes will definitely hurt you. You can see today, even on LinkedIn, if you have seen the banks are being uh, they are being uh, analyzed by the number of clicks you need to make an account opening. So come on, what? Sometimes, some time ago, banks were compared in you know uh, interest rates and, and uh, <laughs> cost of their uh, account. No, today it's about number of clicks. And of course, I'm not going to say it's the only factor, but I'm saying it's becoming more uh, vocalized in the market and uh, definitely in digital banking today. And an example of PSD2 regulation was a nice, strong uh, driver to, let's say, standardize authentication. How we can help? We believe we can give you the a view that is local and regional in being on top of regulation. We have a nice experience how to talk with such regulators and make sure you're compliant. We believe that user experience can be definitely improved and there are different ways how to achieve it. I'm gonna show you a nice demo of this, how, how we see it. And we can talk about different aspects, by the way, and some banks with us build their own authentication flows. We are ready to do this. High level of security, definitely, improving in the project itself. We integrate with different systems and applications. We have the local presence. And in the end, we know that the main, let's say, business driver is also the cost reduction for, for your customers or for your for our customers, which is your, your banking budget. How does it work? To show you an example, we're gonna switch to the demo now. We will show you our demo environment which is running in amazon web services we thought it would be nice to show you that uh, today's uh, it infrastructure also view could be fully cloud-based uh, depending on regulation of course uh, will your regulator allow it will your internal uh, compliance allow it but you're seeing a demo in our amazon web services uh, service center in frankfurt so this is EU-based. However, there are different, of course, available all around the world. It's fully Kubernetes or Dockerized ready environment. Uh, not to go too much technically, the important thing is you can take the, the resources you need as an organization from Amazon in this example, or from Microsoft Azure, for example, and deploy it in, deploy it in a matter of minutes. So uh, it's very much, again, optimizing the pain 
of having the infrastructure all in place. I'm not saying it's the best way to go. There are some pros and cons to every business case. Do you want to have it in the cloud? We are just showing you that this can be fully, fully uh, deployed in this example of Amazon Web Services. So going to the demo now, you can see our demo site. We will send you this link after this webinar. Uh, where the customer will be enrolled to download a token application. This will be a Seco branded demo token. However, uh, of course, in our projects, we are fully deploying with the branding and colors of, of the bank or the, or the institution that needs such, a, such an application. So fully white labeled application for you. You will see that this process is fully online. It could be the same in your environment, of course. Your customer could apply uh, in a secure way to open a banking account or open an additional mobile token app fully, fully online. And here we are uh, definitely according to regulation and some banks use our systems to open an account and get a loan fully, fully online uh, without going to the branch. So the process is that the customer, let's say, entered some data. And you can do this process later on, which we will send you the link to try it out. Uh, downloading the application for Android or iOS. Then doing the activation code on their device. They could manually input this or even better scan a QR so that this um, user ID and the initial password will be inputted to the token. They are defining their own PIN, which is important. The customer can define their own authentication uh, uh, login purpose, which is not stored on the device, very important. And that's it. So in a matter of minutes, the customer in this demo environment, which is used only to show you the technology, fully activated a strong authentication method on its device, fully remotely, without calling the branch, without calling the, the call center, or without going to the branch. OK, now that I have a mobile token on the left hand side here, which is a mobile phone, I'm going to go to log in with some of the nice features that we have with uh, so-called frictionless authentication. So you can scan a QR on your website. Imagine this is, let's say, an e-banking site of a bank that is digitally signed that will be uh, bound to this session ID. And it will only allow me to log into my uh, e-banking. So and this is a very fast process. You can look at it here. As soon as I scan this QR code with my token that was unlocked, I will be logged into my e-banking instantly. So this is the mobile phone side, and this is my website. So the process for the customer was two seconds. However, the background of this was that we scanned the challenge that was digitally signed with this QR code. We made our dynamic password based on this session ID, and we logged in the customer. So there is much higher security than one-time password even, definitely than static passwords. And the user uh, experience was not harmed. I would say it was much more improved. I didn't even enter here a username or a password or a one-time password. It was one scan with my soft token that was unlocked on my device. So you can see this customer is logged in here. Now, that is something that's more even risky or let's say secured is the transaction itself. So let's see, we're preparing a transaction. We make two transactions here. To digitally sign such transactions, you would have to add the data of those transactions into some token device. So this can be a hardware token where you're gonna enter amount of first transaction, amount of second transaction, some, let's say, data about the first and second or challenges. It's called dynamic linking in PSD2 world. So it means you are entering the data of the transaction to some token device, generating a unique response, and submitting the transaction for execution. How to do it with a push message is as soon as I click push, I will receive the data through the push message on my token device here on the left-hand side. And what's important, once I click here, I can see the exact transaction details, amount, uh, IBAN number. And this data will be used as the challenge for the token to do the dynamic linking and generating a dynamic password. So if there was a man in the middle attack in my browser here, I would definitely see a different kind of a transaction account. For example, I'm not sending money to Robert, I'm sending it to the fraudster, and the amounts maybe would be different as well. So 
in a single process, again, of two or three seconds, you're getting much higher security, confirming on your phone, and executing a transaction on your e-banking. The same process, the same workflow would work for e-commerce transaction, you know, paying on a web shop or, or for a third party application, PSD2, or, you know, signing a contract with a bank. So you can have the same workflow uh, with, of course, the data that can be pushed through a push message fully, fully online by the customer. The thing is that this transaction needed mobile data. So to do it with a push, your mobile phone needs mobile uh, data to get this push. There is always a fallback option that's fully offline. For example, scanning a QR code. So maybe your customer is in roaming. You will do the same transaction details with the digitally signed QR code. Once it's scanned by the customer, you will see it here. Click. He can again see these transaction details, generate locally on the device without mobile data the response, and then maybe manually input a six-digit confirmation on the e-banking or here with mobile data, again, he can confirm, he or she can confirm, and transaction will be executed instantly. So much better user experience and much higher security than, for example, SMS OTP, and there is no cost. So for such a transaction to work, even one SMS might cost you some money, and with a push message or a QR code and with some mobile data or with a manual input, this is fully without additional cost to third-party uh, providers. Other than this, we wanted to show you in this demo how we can, of course, do it fully manually. But the important part is the so-called uh, self-administration of the device. So your customer can fully uh, redistribute the application, use the biometrics or not on the device. We support Android and iOS, uh, face IDs, fingerprints uh, from the devices. Change the PIN, delete a token, migrate to a new device. Very important feature. Your customer, for example, bought a new phone. They don't have to go to the branch. They don't have to call your call center. They can do the whole process fully uh, and easily on their device itself. So migrating it, generating a new token, uh, authentication, uh, activation code, and with a new device, uh, activating it on the, on the second device. So this was what we wanted to show you. Of course, we can go into much more details later on, but I really invite you to go to our demo site. We will send you this link also with the follow-up to this presentation and the webinar and to try it out by yourself. To browse through the solutions that make this magic happen, I'm going to spend some little time about what are the solutions in place to uh, achieve such, such authentication workflows. SXS is our brand name for the security access server solution that is a centralized single point of authentication for different devices, channels, and services. What does it mean not to go technical? Any hardware token in the market you have currently in place in your bank or the one that you might buy tomorrow that is standardized to OATH, which is a, let's say, standard in the market, be it Vasco, Gemalto, HID, and Trust, we can support it on our server side. This is important because we are not a hardware token vendor. We believe your hardware tokens should be unlocked. They should not be locked into any vendor. So we can support them, for example, having existing Vasco tokens at some, uh, let's say, customers of yours. You don't need to kill this. We can silently migrate them to the new SXS environment. And tomorrow you can buy Gemalto or HID. We don't care. Of course, we can offer them for you. But uh, hardware is something that's anyhow, let's say, phasing out. So we believe that you should support them, but focus on more user-friendly and, let's say, um, <laughs> cost-friendly solutions like software tokens. You have seen an example of the software token. You will see it also below. But SMS, still something that can be supported. For us, we believe that authentication should be opened, and it should be a landscape of devices that fits best your business need. Looking at the channels that it can be used, We've seen some demos like internet banking integrated into the mobile banking, definitely. We did not show this demo today, but you would not even see the token application. It can be fully integrated in the background of the mobile banking, and you use it to uh, do your banking in a silent authentication, for example, of the customer. Also, e-commerce very much booming today. There is 3D Secure 2.0 uh, 
regulation more and more in place in a lot of countries and you need to have strong customer authentication to do your e-commerce and in the end what we mo mentioned also is the enterprise approach meaning remote work of your employees or your, some of your corporate customers for example you can use the same system at no extra cost to do internal needs authentication or the external one Functionalities, which we showed in the demo, I will not waste too much of this time, is definitely all of the authentication needs of your uh, organization, administration, meaning device management, user management, you all get it in a single suite of products, and all the reporting needed for internal or maybe external needs, like audit logs, which are encrypted, user data, token data, all of this comes in the package of SXS. Mobile token, this is a, let's say a mobile app that can be built for your organization uh, as a very completely customizable and adjusted to your brand in the branding guide if we build it for you or we provide you with a software development kit an sdk that is a let's say piece of software which you can integrate to your existing mobile apps uh, you, which you have or want to build as your own brand so these functionalities, we also saw a couple of them in the demo, but it's important that all of the authentication methods are supported. Self-administration, very important to make sure your customers don't have to go to the branch or don't have to call you. They can do it all fully remotely and that the token itself is fully working if it's offline and or online with mobile data. They can have multiple devices and the pin it's important for the security experts there is not stored on the device it's used as one of the characteristics for this process not to go too much technically we can discuss it later on a nice feature of the mobile phone everybody is using it is the biometry so we can unlock the mobile token using advanced biometrics like fingerprints or face ids for both ios and android and of course, this, this requires a mobile phone that has such native features installed on their devices. Identity and access management is the part of the workflow. I'm not gonna to go too much into details that enables your, your customers to have a more seamless experience if you have more than one application. For example, I mentioned logging into your e-banking and then maybe you have a button go to your trading platform or go to your uh, marketplace or go to your savings something calculator that's an external application. If you would have an identity and access management system, you could share this verified authentication and verified user, uh, let's say credential with different applications. It's especially important when we see it today in PSD2 world in Europe, where open banking will be more and more uh, let's say present where you could share this authentication from a third party provider from your bank for example so your bank could even uh, delegate such an identity to third party application this is something that's becoming more and more important but uh, i saw that there were some fintechs applying also for this webinar this is very important for them so they need to be able to access in a secure way the that customer data with of course consent of the customers uh, with with such a solution it can be done what does it do it's of course improving it efficiency because you have a single place to administer the user identity definitely it enhances security because you can have a single authentication standard for the whole organization you need to use it's universal monitoring and auditing again single place to cover all accesses if such a deployment will be done and of course your customers will be happier not to authenticate five times to all five of your systems in your organization ai powered security module is something we are cooking and it's quite new like i mentioned some of these let's say blocks are already in production in some of our customers we will combine behavioral analytics of our customers app protections meaning algorithms for application self-defense adaptive authentication meaning going higher in authentication when the risk is higher going lower or not even asking for authentication if there is no risk and geolocation and some other information from the customers and this all will be used as risk inputs 
when doing your authentication or identity verification of your customers. We believe this is the way forward. And uh, pretty much, of course, there are some of you here on this webinar who are our existing customers. And with some of you, we're already talking about this. So behavioral authentication will increase the security, but it will definitely increase the uh, user experience. And something we see here, we are seeing also the regulator more and more approving this, understanding that this data, of course, if it's managed in a very secure and let's call it GDPR way, can be used to improve the overall process. Risk-based authentication components, I will not go too detailed, but basically we provide an SDK that's integrated with the mobile app. It collects device information. We collect all this data and then send it to a risk assessment system that is, let's say, taking into account such inputs as well when deciding should the transaction be risky or not, or should there be additional authentication needed. Behavioral authentication is, as I mentioned, a new, new thing. Pins and passwords are being considered more and more as outdated methods. It's not going to happen today, believe me, and it's not going to be for every transaction in the world. But some of the processes can already be, let's say, streamlined and, and allowed without, uh, let's say, a more uh, strict and heavy authentication for the customer. Because behavior is something that's basically the most reliable method of a user. However, it's challenging to get this data about the customer and how to know them that well. And of course, there are privacy, let's say, challenges. Will the customers adopt for such a service or not? But we are definitely technology-wise going to be supporting more and more of such processes in the future. How will this authentication look like? Let's, this is a, let's say this is a glimpse into the future. The user will no longer have to memorize passwords, enter the PIN, or rewrite codes. The behavior will be the identity, let's say, authentication method. And uh, based on the risk, uh, maybe this is a risky transaction or not, the customer will be addressed more, let's say, more strictly if needed. If not, maybe you will be allowed to make this transaction that you make every time. In the experience point, we don't want to waste too much of your time. We just want to show you that our experience stems from around the world. We have a nice case studies, for example, with Unicredit Group, that is our some of our longest long-term partners in this authentication, which we did with a project that started in Vienna in 2010. We provide a multi-tenant cloud deployment for them in nine countries with consistent UX and branding in all of these countries. And believe me, all of them were compliant with PSD2, the ones that are in EU, of course, and local regulations in EU or outside. And uh, we can definitely improve the TCO for such a project on the authentication need. And we provide technology that is, I would say, up to date in every country, no matter the size of such a group project. Similar one in Teza Sao Paulo, also doing their group digitalization project called Digical. Again, ASECO is chosen as the group authentication and mobile banking provider with, for example, supporting different hardware token devices in every subsidiary. So uh, we support some hardware tokens in Croatia, other ones in Egypt and other ones in Hungary. They don't have a group, let's say, standard for a hardware token, but they make sure that every subsidiary has the power to choose what is best for them in the local market and in the needs and the cost that they want to achieve. Another example that's quite, I would say, nice to show you, maybe uh, a known brand in, in uh, Europe again, is Erste Bank. For example, there on the four, let's say, screens you're seeing here, all of these are applications built by Erste or third party vendors, and all of them are using our SDK for authentication, meaning as the card club is the card mobile app, card payment app, mobile banking is the mobile banking app, CaxPay is a peer-to-peer -peer mobile payment app, and Erste Wallet was the uh, payment on uh, cash registers kind of an application. All of them using our SDK in the background and a single authentication server, by the way, which is is important, centralized ecosystem for authentication. So if you're a customer of Erste, all of these apps can work with a single user ID, right? You don't have to do for every one of these applications, especially for workflow or something, they can all share the same user identity 
and the same authentication flow for the customers. And of course, it's built in their branding and colors. You don't see an Aseco logo here if you don't want to. Key takeaways, I've took an hour of your time today. Well, basically, we believe that security and seamless user experience in authentication can be achieved. It's not going to be easy. It's definitely a process and there is a lot of, let's say, work ahead of us. But some key messages we want to share with you with this fine day is to revisit your authentication approach. Things have changed not only in the last three years, but in the last three months. I believe if you check with your regulator in, or the compliance officer or the IT or the business, a lot of things have changed the last three months even. So maybe some things can be simplified, some costs can be revised, and uh, you could use authentication as one of the quick wins to, to do it. Don't wait for the regulator to push you. We know this. It's always a head, let's say, uh, uh, an effort for us as well as the customer when the regulator deadline is there. We, you know, we work it out and we make it in the end, but there are nice examples from the market and we are ready to share with you a lot of experience like this, how to fine tune your authentication on the organization level. We believe user behavior will become more important. And if you're not doing this today, this is of course nothing of an issue, but uh, a nice announcement it is that sooner or later, you can get a lot of value from this behavior. Is it improving UX or some other areas of your business? We believe it will be an important part. Introducing single authentication ecosystem will optimize cost. I showed an example of the group level authentication projects, but definitely we can build a business case for you if you're a small bank, a mid-sized bank, or a huge bank. The cost optimization will definitely, we, we can show you. And in the end, to wrap it up, Let's talk. We can help you on this journey. I hope you know these messages that I've sent to you and that are based on our experience can share some light on what we do quite well. And let's 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 chat after this. And I again invite you to try out our demo site. We have nothing to show uh, to hide. This is a very nice user experience you can try on your mobile phone, and you can download your app and do it on our website in a matter of minutes. I hope. Okay. Now going to the questions and answers. I see one question here. From our experience, how challenging is the process of replacing hardware tokens with software tokens? Well, to be honest, uh, we uh, devise a very cautious approach, meaning, yes, you can do it in a big bang, you can kill all the hardware tokens, but better approach was start with software tokens and offer them first. Then, as I mentioned before, show some value of the software tokens compared to hardware tokens. And then in a three to six months process, let's say phase them out uh, little by little. So the customers that are gonna actually do your digital banking, the ones that are logging actively, doing transactions, they will appreciate a nice software token. So hardware token is only their, let's say used behavior. But when you show them how easy they can do it with a push notification or a QR code, the process is not so hard. Definitely, you will have customers that will not want to change. And this in our percentages are, let's say, 20%. For them, you can leave, again, these hardware tokens. And by the way, switch them to our server side so you don't have to have two. And sooner or later, they will phase out. Or maybe some banks did it uh, saying, okay, Software tokens are free, hardware tokens, once the battery dies out in a year, you will have to pay for because as a bank, we have to pay for that. Okay, next question. Could you please throw more light on user behavior as an authentication method? Ah, so basically we can collect the data that is in this example, of course, the software token where you know where you are currently as Robert. So I'm a frequent traveler, for example. I travel as, as my business, as the international sales guide in ASECO. I go to every week to a different continent usually, but let's say I, I'm traveling a lot. So if I want to make a transaction now while I am in Nigeria, I believe the question is from Nigeria, and 10 minutes ago, I was logged into an ATM machine in, uh, in Croatia. This is a high risk because you cannot be at two places at once. There are SDKs, which we are using and partnering with third parties as well, 
of the how fast you're using the mobile phone, how quickly you are typing the amount when you're paying, how, uh, you know, how you are actually, you know, there are a lot of sensors on your device. And this forms a pattern of your behavior that the this SDK can follow. So I'm not saying today you would do everything by behavior, but I'm saying more and more the behavior will be one of the attributes that will be considered in your risk profile. And if it's a very low risk transaction and you know this profile is still the same as the last 10 days, how you use your mobile banking or your device, then let's say your behavior is not causing any red flags. What is my opinion about digital certificate as authentication method for e-banking? Definitely we are using them a lot. So here by digital certificates, I guess you're questioning about PKI infrastructure, right? So these are uh, qualified electronic certificates. We believe these are the, and to be honest, in the regulatory view, they are the only uh, legally binding certificate, uh, legally binding instrument, like a handwritten signature still in a lot of countries. So yes, they should be used. Uh, for e-banking, depends on what you want to do. If you want to sign a contract with a bank as a customer, and if you want to have a legally binding document that will be you know, proven in court, then I would say definitely yes. And if the regulator is pushing you, yes. But if you want to authenticate a transaction, even for co corporate e-banking these days, this could be a bit uh, an overkill. Uh, it is the highest level of security, however, on the certificate level or on the cryptography level. Still, there are attacks that have proven that even with a digital certificate, if there is a strong malware on the PC that is being used, for example, you could uh, fraud this system. So digital certificates, yes, especially for onboarding the customer, signing a document itself, but for signing a transaction and you know the, authenticating the users, I don't think it's mandatory anymore. And the security level, it's it's quite similar, or to be honest, we have seen in the region more attacks on this, this than on the strong customer authentication being secured by a sec. Good. I don't see any other question. So not to take any more of your time, I would wrap this up, say thank you really for the active discussion. And I hope that the content we, we presented to you was something of, of interest. And to repeat, we are here definitely to follow up, to try out our demo site and to check if there are other areas where ASECO could help you in the secure but seamless user experience for authentication. Thank you very much. All the best.